You are listening to No, You're Crazy. My name is Susan Denae. We all have crazy. What separates us is how we choose to deal with it. I'm going to be delivering engaging and actionable tools to own your crazy, treat your crazy, and turn it into your own superpower. I hope that you walk away from this show feeling the power and strength within you. And never forget to enjoy your journey because you are worth it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Know Your Crazy Talk Show. My name is Susan Denae, and you are listening to Emotional Recovery in the Raw. You know, this show is all about digging into four key areas of life, which I believe our crazy can run to extremes when we are under stress, extreme stress. Those four key areas are finances, relationships, health, and career professional. This is why I am so excited for today's guest because we will be diving in to, I'd say, professional career uh, arena, but sprinkled, I I think the emphasis that I'm really going to enjoy diving into today with today's guest is creativity. And when we're truly uh, honoring our authentic expression, and today's guest is an expert in the written expression. His name is Todd Bryson. He is an optimist who writes. He's an Amazon best-selling author and award-winning ghostwriter featured in Inc. Magazine, Time, and CNBC. He also co-owns Bad Assery Academy, a business where students learn to write well and make money doing it. Back in his corporate days, he worked on a global marketing team in Paris, France. Most of his ideas, so most of his ideas work across many cultures. When he's not pounding the keyboard, you'll find him walking his spoiled French bulldog, drinking dandelion coffee in the kitchen with his wife, Kate, or taking a bath with a book. Uh, Today, Todd and I will be discussing just everything about writing that he wants to bring to the show today. Uh, Specifically, he'll be giving five ways to help your writing shine. I have a lot of questions for Todd today as writing is something I I thoroughly enjoy, and it's lovely to have an expert on the show who specializes in this. Uh, So welcome, Todd. Welcome to the Know Your Crazy show. Thank you so much. Um, Really excited to be here and really excited to chat with you again, Susan. Yeah, yeah. Todd and I met because I was one of his students and continue to be actually a student in the Bad Assery Academy. I, I joked a couple times on the show, some of them may remember, I said, I, I think I, I just paid some money to learn how to Twitter, but it was such <laughs> a fantastic experience uh, and the discipline that it brought and the community that you provide in your academy. Uh, it just it, If you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about the academy, I'll just kind of kick off there because I just think it's such a wonderful tool for individuals to participate in. Yeah, sure. So um, Tim Denning and I run the academy and some people will know the name, some won't. He is an online writer based in Melbourne, Australia. I'm an online writer based in Dixon, Tennessee. So roughly a gazillion miles away. And (laughs) we got connected just like everyone does these days. We were both writing online and and doing our separate things. 2020, um, I was part of the, you know, the layoffs that kind of ripped through everything and had a big pivot moment to decide what to do next, honestly, and Mm -hmm. um, started talking with Tim. He showed me kind of his vision for what he saw um, building a a real academy, right? Like not just a a course and a niche business to, I don't know, have have a website and do some nice things, but he he really wanted to be impactful and, and change how people wrote and thought about writing and earned an income through writing or using writing as a tool for that. Flash forward to, uh, gosh, nearly three years later, and mm-hmm. uh, and here we are. You were talking about specifically um, a writing challenge that we run. It's a mm-hmm. 30, 30 day challenge, four weeks, where people are um, held to the standard of writing something every day. And we use Twitter for that, just because of the speed of, mm-hmm. of publication and the anonymity, because many people come to Tim through LinkedIn, they have this professional career and they're like, Hey, I, I don't know if I can write anything without my, my manager kind of pulling me to the side and say, Hey, you're going to reflect poorly on the company. 
So we use Twitter just as a way to get people off the ground and start expressing their views. It seems simple in concept. Like you said, I feel like I just paid to to learn how to write on Twitter, but the emotional journey you go mm-hmm. through getting consistent in having a thought, clarifying it with the language, and then having the courage to share it with whoever may be looking, even if it's, you know, five, 10, 15 people, that's, that's the real catalyst that, that we like to, to change with people. And then of course, everything else, you know, we, we specialize in medium.com and LinkedIn and copywriting and and various other courses. But the, the one that is live and takes people through Mm. a journey is, is really something. So two things, what, what's coming to my head when, as you just shared what you shared was one, I don't think I realized that you had made the shift uh, from the COVID, from the pandemic, mm, from yeah. really have, you know, me too, in a way, right? Like I was in 2021. So I didn't quite, I didn't under, I, I don't think I grasped that con. I didn't know that until just when you shared that, what a fantastic, for me, I, I find it awesome because you are an example of what is possible. I, I like to say the pandemic brought a lot of things, you know, whichever way you want to look at it, but the positive that it brought was it allowed a lot of individuals to make a decision that I think inside they really wanted to be making for a long time. And you did it and doing it successfully, by the way. So, you know, <laughs> kudos to you. That's fantastic. Yeah, Thank that's you. fantastic. Uh, stuff. The good story there is how my wife kind of took the news. So, um, Kate and I have been married for 10 years now. And in 2020, when I called her and, and told her I got laid off, I think she was more upset than I was because she was like, oh my gosh, you know, what are we going to do? And in the meantime, mm-hmm. I, I'd been writing online and I had a couple books. I By that time, I already had, you know, the ghost writing under my belt as well. And um, in the weeks where I was getting you know, severance, I, I kind of had some time to make a plan. Right. And so I went to my office and I like drew up all these diagrams and I like had some charts and graphs and I come to her and I say, okay, babe, I think that I can go out on my own. I, I don't think that I need to get another job. I don't think I need to apply for jobs. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to take this opportunity and this opportunity and this opportunity and I'll mark like the income as we go. And so you can see like, what we're earning and and keep from having a panic attack or anything like that. Um, And so that's the plan. And she listens to it very calmly and she nods along. And then she says, okay, I'm not super comfortable with this, but I I trust you. And I understand you want to give it a go. The only thing I ask is that in addition to chasing these courses and this business that you also like look for and apply for jobs, like, just take a few interviews to see what's out there and, and keep that line in the water. And I said, absolutely. Without a doubt, I will do that. I'll take the interviews. And then I promptly turn around. It took absolutely no interviews. I didn't look for a single (laughs) job. I went the other direction entirely. And luckily it would work out. I've been told um, by some friends, that's like a classic husband move. It's like, okay, yeah, babe, I got, and then just just I, I think it's a classic entrepreneur move, yeah. really, yeah, you yeah. know, because <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but for me, when it became apparent that I was going to be heading in another direction, it's really hard to think I want to go yeah. back. You know, it feels like it's backwards. You know, it yes. feels like, oh, you know, like even thinking I'm going to do something part time or, you know, any, it feels so backwards because once the creative yeah. and, and that, I think the biggest hurdle for entrepreneur when, when you're making that shift is, is really that, that first decision, mm. I'm going to do this, like the first decision and then taking the leap. And I'll just call it, you know, the leap of faith, the leap of whatever, the leap of vision, whatever it is. Right. But once we take that, it's really like, Oh, and, and I yeah. love the fact that you share so openly about the experience with your partner and your wife, because me too, you know, I've got a yeah. husband and you know, when you're on this type of journey, you know, the support from the family and the support from the partner, it's essential. It really is because your mind has to be so clear and focused and because there's a lot of doubt that can creep in, right? I mean, yeah. there's a lot of doubt that can creep in. And, uh, you, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Now, for me, if Kate and I are in disagreement on something, it just feels like there's this little fire in the back of my brain all the time. And so yep. if that's not quenched, I can't do anything. Yep, I, I hear you. I so hear you. You mentioned about having your, uh, you're a best-selling author. 
yeah. uh, and a ghost writer. And when I was reading your bio, I wanted to ask you, would you mind explaining ghost writer? <laughs> yeah. Well, essentially a ghost writer is what happens when a person has a lot of money and they don't want to write a book themselves, but they want to have a book. And that's, mm -hmm. that's oversimplifying it. But okay. what will happen in my case, there was this uh, British entrepreneur um, was the one of the first 10 employees at an enormous company in the UK. Uh, so got a, this big payout when the company IPO'd. He's done some startups since then. And he had this kind of working thesis about how success in startups worked. And he gave a few talks here and there. Um, he found me because his idea was the exact title of something that I had written online. So he's Googling like, oh, what, you know, what is this thing? And he's Googling what he calls it, finds me. Mm -hmm. And then we get on a call. I thought he was spam at first because it was like, it was 2016. So like, we're, yeah. you know, we're sort of comfortable with the internet, but it's not a definite that everyone's real. So I think he's a bot. I ignore him for weeks. <laughs> um, but we finally get on the phone and he explains the idea to me. So for us, it just looked like he presents me the big idea. We were on calls for four weeks, I think, three mm -hmm. days a week, three hours at a time. And wow. essentially that process is him downloading his whole life experience into my brain. And then I okay, okay, leave me alone. And then I go to the side and write, you know, chapter by chapter and we have checkpoints to go, okay, is this kind of what you mean? And on my end, or, or usually a high quality ghostwriter uh -huh. will not just hear what the person says and put it down on paper. They'll go, okay, here's how the audience should consume this information. Like you're saying all these things that sound nice, but in order to not make that word soup, we're going to put it in this kind of structure. So if someone's brand new to your world, they can go, oh, okay, I understand. Like step one is this, step two is this, step three is this. And a good ghostwriter will not only hear the information from someone else, they'll be able to write in that voice and categorize and, and order all of those things in a way to make sense, even if someone has never heard of that person or, or that idea before. Would it be fair to say there's just a um, an accurate conveying of the individual that you're writing on behalf of, uh, like a good ghostwriter is able to, um, well, I think you said just have their voice come through. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. And and I mean, that's, that's one of the toughest parts about writing is sounding like yourself ironically, and I'm sure we'll get into some of this later, but it, it's a long sort of mental and emotional battle to go yeah. through. I'm going to mimic these writers that I admire so much to now I have my own voice and my own style and my own cadence and sentence structure and all these different things. And and like I said, good ghostwriters are, are sort of chameleons and they take on the, uh, the voice of whoever they're talking to. Um, and a lot of that weirdly is just not to get too far off track is client it's management. Okay. You you just listen yeah. to what someone has to say, and then you try to eliminate all of your own prejudices and mm -hmm. understandings of the way that you would write. And you say, okay, how would Susan write this? How would Todd write this? How would, how would Joey say this to a person on the street? And, and you try to stick very close to that. Um, because especially now trying to keep it academic or professional is just not, not something that's worth doing really. Yeah. Yeah. Now the, the title now, is that the best selling book that you mentioned? It's, or I actually read about the creative curse, the author of the creatives curse. Is that the one? That's not the, that's the best selling one. That's not the award winning one. Um, since I was a ghost writer and there are contracts involved, I can't really say the name gotcha. of the, of the other book, the yeah. creatives curse is mine. And that was a bestseller on, on Amazon. And I'm very, I'm very proud of that book as well, obviously. Oh, I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to snag it and read it. I, I'm excited do to it. check it out. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, tell me, it. when did you first know that you wanted to be a writer? You know, even though you prepped me on this, I, I had to think a lot about it because I'm not sure career decisions ever happen like in, in one moment, but mm -hmm. 
I, I think there are two sides to every career choice. So if you're listening to this right now and you're wondering what you should do, I think a very good hack is to kind of look in your past at experiences that meant a lot to you and then go from there and see if you can tie those to some sort of skill and eventually some sort of you know monetization, whether it's a job or, or a business. Um, for me, two big experiences stick out. One was when I was in the fifth grade. I think a lot of times we choose careers based on like something that impacted us before mm -hmm. we had the skills or even the knowledge to know what was going on. I'm in fifth grade and we have this reading assignment. We're reading a book called A Bridge to Terabithia. And it's a young adult book, borderline probably middle school, but I think you know the teachers are trying to prep us for where we're going. And I always read ahead, like to this day. That's kind of mm -hmm. like, I love to read and it was always something that, that came pretty easily to me. So I'm reading through this book and we're at chapter 10, chapter 12, so on and so on. And right at the end of that book, there's just an unspeakable tragedy to one of the main characters. Like it is, it is a horrific ending. Um, and the teacher was supposed to prep all of us for this ending. Like we we're had the reading schedule. We read out loud some in class. And so the day before we're supposed to read this passage, she's going to prep us on the horror to come. And Todd doesn't care because he just wants to read a book. Like he's fifth grade Todd. He's going to read ahead. And Todd finishes the book. The unspeakable tragedy happens. And I know the book is really old and it has a movie now. So probably most mm -hmm. people know what happens, but on the off chance that someone's <laughs> listening to my voice right now has never heard of that. I want you to have the full emotional impact of what I had to go through. So I, I'm not going to say what happens, but at the end of the book, there's a horrible event and I I'm at my desk in school, right? So it's whiteboard, 30 of my peers, Miss Garten up in front of the classroom with a whiteboard, like going on and on about something else like math, probably because I wasn't listening. Um, and I close the book and I just remember like sitting there in shock and I feel tears come to my mm -hmm. eyes. And I'm a, I'm a fifth grade boy, Susan. Like I'm not supposed to cry at all, mm -hmm. much less yeah. because of a book, but I keep, I, I, I just can't purge this memory. And I'm sitting there in my chair, suddenly sobbing and no one has any idea what's going on, including my teacher who just thinks that I've had this random breakdown. And after a few minutes, she finally like gets it out of me. What happened was that, oh, I read a book. Like literally that was all it took. And that event was impactful because I, I just realized, oh my gosh, like I just read some words and cried. Mm -hmm. And I think that went a long way to making me want to have that impact on, on someone else, whether it was making them laugh, making them cry, making them motivated or encouraged, making them, you know, in later days, like buy and purchase things, all of those emotions and impulses are within reach when you can write really well and honestly, and, and express yourself to a reader. So that moment, I, I think about it a lot and it's definitely something that, that drove the career. Yeah, that's a fantastic story. I had a flashback when you were saying that my uh, my writing story from when I was a kid, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was in third and fourth grade, both years, I won the young authors contest at the elementary hey. school. And then we got to go to state, which I was raised in Nebraska. So it was like Lincoln. And when you went yeah. to state, you got your story got to be read and, and all that good stuff. And, and then they give you a, a book to take home. And it was a dog called Kitty. And <laughs> I too <Yeah>. remember... <laughs> I remember shedding a tear at the end of reading that book uh, on my way home. Mom was driving, you know, and I was in the back seat reading this book and just crying like a crazy little girl. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was it was the emotion. Uh, something you hit on there as far as the uh, I, I was I checked out one of your blogs on LinkedIn. I went to your LinkedIn page and I was checking okay. out one of your blogs and there was something that you wrote. I think it was back in 2019. Write okay. words that are deeply tied to human senses. Write words mm. that are deeply tied to human senses. That resonated with me. Uh, well, I know the name of the show, Know You're Crazy, but really emotional recovery in the raw and how much we are connected to, you know, as human beings to our five senses. Mm. And, and, and so when I read that, I thought that was a really cool way to say this, this is 
really about effective communication, but truly impacting somebody intimately and emotionally and letting them have an experience. And, you know, it's just such a beautiful thing. And the other thing that you wrote that I loved, and I was just, I wasn't quoting this exactly the other day, but I was saying, I was in the same ballpark, but you said, inspiration without instruction is useless. Mm -hmm. And what I was saying, yeah, (laughs) it's fantastic, isn't it? And what I was saying was inspiration without action is nothing. Like I can, you know, I was, I was referring at the time to some uh, recovery meetings and I said, I can come into a recovery meeting and be inspired all damn day, but if I don't take action. Yeah. inspiration is going to run out. And then I read that on your uh, inspiration without instruction is useless. Yeah. It's just fantastic. I think that writing specifically is a way to change someone's mind. And mm-hmm. we live in a very contentious time, right? Where kind of people just build their own universes online and then sit and and yell at people, you know, in Twitter threads or whatever. What I love about writing and maybe I, maybe I specifically mean what I love about reading is that you're giving the author a chance to change your mind. If you choose to read something, that means you are open to the possibility that whatever they have to say is true. Unlike if you stumble across a Twitter thread and it's just suddenly in your face, mm-hmm. or if you're watching Fox News or CNN and you have people like arguing with each other, I feel like there's a low chance that you can actually change your beliefs and change your behaviors. However, if you're reading with an open mind, you can see the world in a new way. And there's no threatening tones of voice. It's a very private practice, right? Because you do it alone in silence and, and you start to open your mind to different things that are are possible. And And whether that's, I don't know, how to make more money, online or how to combat climate control or how to set boundaries in relationships. That's what I see the point of books being. And so I think when I say stuff like um, inspiration is useless without instruction, I think that writers are obligated to hit both sides of that coin. Like if I try to tell you that I don't know, the planet needs to be saved. Go save the planet. Go save the planet. Go save the planet. The planet's in danger. Planet's in danger. Whatever it is. And I don't I don't know what to do with that. That causes an enormous anxiety within me. And we see it like that's what mm-hmm. we're seeing, right? Like I, yeah. everyone thinks there, there, there are huge problems in society or threats to the planet. And we have a horde of people who are just anxious all the time because mm-hmm. we don't we don't know what to do. And so that's why. Personally, I I don't read a lot of online stuff, but I read a lot of books and newspaper articles, like magazines and stuff, because I want to know what to do. Like I, I want the instructions. If I'm going to change my mind, I want the instructions as well. So I have trouble with these online writers sometimes who who lean all the way into the go and do and be and hustle mm-hmm. and grind and all this, but yeah. don't don't have the instruction to back it up that thing has its place but it's ultimately limited in in how it can change somebody yeah the uh picking up a book being um say a safe way to be willing to grow safe yes a, sa- a safe way to be willing to grow to take under consideration i like the way you put that to take under consideration someone else's perspective you know, how many people really dig their heels in and say my way and are unable yeah. to open their minds to a new way of understanding, perceiving, and ultimately maybe making a drastic change in their belief system on a particular yeah. issue or subject. And if I hear you correctly, what you're expressing or what you're saying is you take that very seriously. And so to be instructed behind that inspiration when you want to write um, it is really taking like you're, you're taking somebody's mind in your hands in a way. And so let's make sure that we're educated enough and we have a good enough skill set in order to uh, impact them. I, I don't know if the appropriate is the right word, but, you know, just make sure that we, we take that with caution and care and with skill and take yeah. the time to learn. Yeah. A hundred percent. Because as, yeah, that... as an author, you have to understand that 
the impact that you can have or as a writer of any kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, what I'm going to do is we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we are going to dive into that. What are the skills? What are the tips that you would give somebody if they're starting out? Uh, or maybe tips you'd give someone who has been writing for a while if they're wanting to you know, elevate their, their stuff, right? Uh, and so we will be back. But before I cut to break, I want to ask you, Todd, how can folks get ahead, get a hold of you if they want to check out, uh, get to the Badassery Academy or check out your website? Where do they got to go? Yeah, best bet for me is to go to toddbryson.com, T-O-D-D-B-R-I-S-O-N.com. And if they forward the email address or the welcome email to me, I've got a special surprise for everyone listening to, to this particular show. Nice. All right. So everyone, we will be back shortly and we will be diving into some skills for all you uh, aspiring writers or those who've been around for a while and you're looking to enhance that skill set. Be back shortly. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Know Your Crazy Talk Show. My name is Susan Denae and you are listening to Emotional Recovery in the Raw if you are joining us for the first half of the show, then you are acquainted with Todd Bryson. Todd Bryson is a best-selling author of The Creative's Curse. Um, he's also a co-creator of the Bad Assery Academy. Uh, today, Todd and I are talking about the professional world of writing, his background in that, and we're moving into the second half of the show talking about skill set when it comes to writing. Uh, I think I'm going to be a great guinea pig for the questions today, Todd, because I'm kind of a guinea pig when it comes to writing, uh, and I've probably got some of the newcomer, I like to say, questions that most individuals might be asking. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of kick off with a couple of those, and I think we're just going to automatically roll into skill set development, some of your recommendations for somebody who's beginning. Uh, but my first one that I want to start with is... I read a quote, most people who write suffer needless writer's block and self-doubt. Hmm. And, and I would probably agree with that. And so my question for you is regarding writer's block and self-doubt, in your opinion, what do you think is one of the most, or like a root symptom of self-doubt or cause of self-doubt when it comes to somebody who's beginning to write? Okay. Well, let's, I'm going to flip this back to you and we're going to do like surgery live on okay. your own brain. So you said you write a lot, right? What uh, You write some now. What's, what's your writing schedule, I guess, look like? Oh, you're asking me the time when I'm not writing. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So in, obviously you've been through our courses and stuff yeah. before. So there was a 30 day period for sure where you were writing. Think back to that time. Were there days where you were slow to start or something in your brain was like, I just really don't, is it, I don't know what to write or I don't know if it's worth writing. Like how did that present when there's some resistance to writing? Absolutely. It would feel like um, dead air. It's like, like nobody's home. Where, where's the idea at? Uh, what do I write now? Through your academy, I learned a lot of, hacks in order and okay. ways to get that going. Right. But that, but it would feel like some days it would just flow, you know, once the creative and the routine got established and then there would come a day where it was just like nothing. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And what did you do on those days when, when it was nothing? What did, what did your inner voice sound like? Uh, the inner voice. Well, my inner voice kind of would go to, okay, there's nothing here. How are you going to come up with something? Yeah. How are you going to come up with something? Yeah. And you're, you're very strong mentally, right? Cause you've, you've been so through some other things in, in different areas. So you have that resilience built in. A lot of people hit that blank and that the reaction is either, oh, I'm out of ideas or like, well, I guess that's that's the main reaction. Like if it's a blank, they're going, I'm out of ideas or I'm just not like, I guess I'm not a writer, right? Like that's the yeah. that's the extension of that is they feel when they run out of ideas that they've also tapped the end of their writing ability. And whenever that's the case, there are a couple of different, um, I guess, seeds of self-doubt when it comes to writing. One of them is that. And it's because typically when people aren't experienced writers, they don't understand that like 
the sticking point is where the good stuff actually starts because mm. if you hit that wall where your brain starts to wonder about things if you feel like you've tapped out your your expertise or personal stories or whatever it is that you want to write about that's when you start searching for more options right so you can either like you said you're very resilient so you can either make the choice to keep writing or make the choice to stop obviously stopping is much easier because you don't have to go search for something but if you've committed to the actual writing habit what happens now is the same thing that happens when your back door is locked and you forgot the key to your house and you need to turn off the oven your brain starts immediately going okay the downstairs window might be unlocked okay did i leave the the garage door open oh, okay wait didn't we hide that extra key under the pot and you think of all these solutions that you wouldn't have before out of necessity and so i think when it comes to like that side of being self doubt it really is you've had to make the decision to keep writing first and then allow your brain to fill in the gaps. If you truly continue to feel kind of tapped out and you're sitting at the computer and you're staring at a blank screen and just nothing is happening, honestly, my best advice is to stop trying and go read something. Um, Stephen King kind of famously said, the two things that all great writers do is read a lot and write a lot. He's been asked about that in the many years since. And, and it comes out that most people who write at that level read three times as much as they write. So for mm -hmm. every, every one 600 page book, Stephen King is writing, he's reading, you know, a 2000 pages of, of other books in that genre. And I'm sure it's a lot more than that, to be honest with you. But the seeds of an idea have to come from somewhere and they can either be personal experience or they can be this stuff here behind me, which is just pages and pages of books written by other people. Um, that's the empty brain side. So, you know, I'm curious because you never struggle with like, is this worth you? Did you ever struggle with like, is this worth doing? No, no. Uh, like that's I've got nice. two books started yeah you know about yeah uh i've got so beautiful <laughs> I, ha I have like a newsletter that I, I started to bang out and then i backed off and so mine yeah. comes more down to needing to be more disciplined with the schedule and the routine and when you get into this world that i'm in it's, there's like so many balls in the air right, um, right. but I, I will tell that i will share with you one of the things that i love about writing is the oh how quickly if for me, if I jump into the writing, how quickly I can get into the flow. Mm. Tell me about that. Well, I think it's, you know, and I think uh, I like the way you were putting what most people might go through when they hit that writer's block or they are, they feel like they're lacking any content to write or an idea. Uh, I think they're crazy. They're writers crazy. I'm, that's what I was thinking of when you were <laughs> saying that, like, oh, he, he's totally identifying writers crazy. For yeah. what would halt somebody uh, to not take to work the action through that stall, right? Yeah. Um, where was I going with that? So I think I totally lost my train of thought. That was such a good thing that you mentioned there about the the crazy and understanding, like when it stops. Oh, oh, uh, something with the the oh the the comparison, the comparison. I, I think that especially in the world that we're in right now with social media. And, and it seems like, I always like to say there's, a, there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, newcomers to, yeah. and, and there's a lot of very successful people also. And I think it can be really tempting uh, to compare and then talk ourselves out of writing something because it's not as good as so-and-so. Yeah. Or I never took a writing class, or this is one of the things I love about your academy because you're teaching people and you're giving them the community to learn. Yeah. Uh, so they're not necessarily having to go graduate from college in, in a course to really get some real foundation so that they can express themselves through writing. Yeah. Um, but that comparison thing, I think, probably talks a lot of people out of it. Yeah. We, I worry that um, social media metrics and monetization of creative work at scale, meaning like the average person can go write and make money 
the average person can make YouTube videos and make money. I think that that has distracted from some of the main benefits of creative work to mm. me, which is, you know, earlier in the show, I talked about reading being a very private experience where you can safely you said, you said the word safe. So I'll give you that mm -hmm. yeah. safely process a new idea and mm -hmm. integrate it into your beliefs without having to be on display. My concern now is that people come to the writing world and chase the data instead of writing to process their own mm. emotions and clarify their own beliefs. Chase the data instead of enjoy yeah. the experience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, it, it, to be clear, like I love going viral. I love making money. All that oh, stuff sure. is great. <laughs> and it could definitely happen when you write. But to me, still to this day, even making a living doing it, it is not the primary benefit of writing for me because what I write for is to understand myself a little better. It's to build my belief system from what I've been reading lately. It's to express concerns or fears about some plan that I've concocted and I'm trying to like poke holes in it. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you flip that on its head and you say, okay, I am writing solely to present this to the world. If that is your main objective and if presenting it to the world the goal is to get as many views, money, whatever is possible, then you're always going to quote unquote, follow that data to like the same places. Because the thing that always gets the things that always get the most attention are just like relationships, fitness, status, money all the time. So if you chase the data, you're always going to wind up in those huge areas where there's massive competition from every other writer on the internet who's following mm -hmm. the data to those huge areas. And you can get distracted from what might actually be unique and interesting writing on another perspective because it came from your life, mm -hmm. but you're just, you don't get there because you're, you're, you're looking at these things out there. there. Most you're lost in the minutia. Yeah. Exactly. You're lost in the minutia in the comparison, man, you just really spoke my world. I, I have, uh, <laughs> I, it's just seriously, not only with writing, but when it came to coaching and kind of in, in the same uh, context, right? Because when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with an individual, uh, that that flow can happen, the intuitiveness kicks in, you know, years of experience. And yet, because I did that for so many years, nearly 20, uh, no compensation, you know, just in the world of recovery, it would feel really cheesy yeah. and almost falsified is that even a word, uh, yeah. doing, you know, getting paid for it, you know, but yeah. yet I also understood that. And, and I understand that there is a, you know, that there can be great service in that realm, but boy, sometimes it just feels cheesy. It just, you know, let me get on, let me get on video and talk. So I, I could talk all damn day on video about stuff I know, but, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. Tim Denning actually gave me a, a great word. You know how Tim is so blunt, uh, just, oh, yeah. you know, just appreciate that. I love blunt. I, I love straightforward. Blunt isn't yeah. even the right, just straightforward. But I remember when he had done uh, something for a review of stuff and, and he just said, you know, something like, don't, don't, um, he, these are, I'm going to mess up his words, but it was something more or less, don't get lost in trying to be an influencer. You're better than that. Mm. Oh and I God. so appreciated that. And I think it's yeah. kind of in the same arena that you're sharing. And also with the writing um, in that whole get, getting lost too much in the data and getting lost, you know, where the art of it is where the true experience and the creativity and the love comes from. Yeah, right? I think so too. And, yeah. you know, I, I, we, we're supposed to talk about skills eventually, but we have, we have to start this conversation here because if you don't think what you're writing about is worth writing about, or if you like keep getting stuck and bailing out, then me telling you how to write a good sentence isn't going to help very much. Isn't going to help. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, starting out with the self-doubt, uh, there was a word you used in the early, in the first part of the show, courage. Yeah. You know, the, the courage to keep on writing, even when you feel as if this isn't any good or where's this going to go. So yeah. To jump forward a little bit, let's say that, okay, we're, we're over the self-doubt. We, we've decided that, hey, we're in this. 
uh, may, maybe, uh, where would you like to pick up from here? I know there was like five steps you were going to suggest, you know, uh, where would you suggest we're over the self-doubt we're going to keep writing. Yep. Maybe we don't know which direction to go in what's next. Yeah, I think, and we have a few things here. They're not necessarily stepwise, right? So we can just kind yeah. of bounce around. I think the best place to start is untangling what most of my clients and some of my students have called a ball of spaghetti which mm -hmm. is like you write that first draft you got the you've got the self doubt checked you sit yourself down and you write for an hour and you have 767 words and then you go back and you're like this is not good like i clearly <laughs> like ramble on in the <laughs> middle of this about some story that i did in college and like that doesn't that doesn't feel like it flows and then at the end the end doesn't even feel like an end. It just stops. Like what's, what's happening here is all lost. And first, like, I like to start there because everyone ends up there. Like me, I've been, writing, fantastic. Pro yeah, yeah. been writing professionally been for <laughs> 15 years in this. And every time the first draft is a complete act of faith because you mm. know, it's going to be bad. And over the years, it'll be less bad, but it, it, I, Stephen King, even Stephen King, I dare say, does not write a novel in one go. And he's like, all right, time to head to the beach. It's yeah. first draft is an act of faith. You're doing your best you can to just get it out of your body. So, and I say body intentionally because most mm -hmm. of the time it's, it's whole body writing. It's not just like an intellectual exercise. So when you're sitting there and you have this pile of words, whether it's 200 words or a thousand words or a whole book. And to put this, let me, let me put that in like actual language for people, whether it's a LinkedIn post or a blog post or a book, like those are the three kind of mm -hmm. levels that we sit at. What I like to do is, is use a trick I learned from a, an internet friend. His name is Joel Schwartzberg. He has a great book called get to the point. Joel is a, a, a speech writer for executives and politicians and one exercise he suggests is called the I believe or the I believe statement. So most people start writing and they have a topic in mind. They say, okay, I want to write about uh, motivation. And so they go, all right, let's write about motivation. They sit down there and write for 750 words. And then they come back and they don't know how to edit because they don't actually know the point that they're trying to make. Mm. So when you run the I believe exercise, what you're trying to do is make a full sentence about something you believe. If you put in the word motivation and you try to tell people, I write about motivation, you're saying, I believe motivation. This is mm. not a full sentence. Yeah. And if at any time you're like testing your post or book or whatever it is, and you don't have a full sentence there, you know that that's a red flag. Because if someone wants to read about a topic, they just go to Google, right? Yeah. We write about, we write blog posts and books and tweets and et cetera, because we want to make a point. So the goal is to change that ending from, I believe motivation to, I believe something. Um, tell me something you believe about, about motivation. Just let's do it on the fly. Cause this is how it really works. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I personally just had to get over resentment of the word motivation. Perfect. Why? Um, because I thought it fell too much into the work hard, burn candle, mm -hmm. morning to night, that type of mentality. And I was applying that belief system to myself. And when I would not uh, achieve that, I would feel uh, bad about myself, a little bit of shame. And so I had to go through this whole thing with motivation. So if I were to manipulate that phrase a little bit I might say kind of not true to me today but where it was was I if this would have been even six months ago um, I believe the word motivation is um, I was going to swear but I won't swear <laughs> <laughs> you would if you were writing yeah <laughs> that's right um, I'm trying to think of a good word I, I believe the word motivation is not faults. Help me out. You're a writer. It's not faults. It's um, I'm trying to let you get there. You're going to let me get there <laughs> like a good teacher. Maybe it's 
maybe it's for sake of time and for sake of everyone yeah, yeah. else. Maybe, maybe it's some, like back then you were thinking that motivational content had its limits. So maybe the, go. I believe statement is just, I believe motivation has its limits. There you go. And if yep. you wanted to go one step further, you could say, I believe motivational videos on YouTube have their limits, right? You, you can alter mm -hmm. that and play with it as much as you want. You then take that I believe statement and you go back through your ball of spaghetti and you say, which of these sentences, paragraphs, subsections support this I believe statement? So what's going to happen is you'll read through that and you'll probably lose about half of it, right? Because it's going to be off topic. You'll also learn that you need to add things in in order to strengthen this post. So now the truth about editing is you're not just cutting stuff out. You're identifying where your argument is weak and you're strengthening that argument in writing by pulling in another example, by filling in a personal story or a case study from a client. If you work with gotcha. someone who watches motivational videos eight hours a day, but they don't get anything done, that's a good story to tell to make your point. And so that simple, I believe statement can go a long way helping folks sort out what fits and what doesn't in a blog post. I love that. Untangling the ball of spaghetti. Is that the what ball you call that? Spaghetti. Untangling the ball of spaghetti. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that that's really good. That has happened to me. Like I've literally wrote and then I've come back and I thought, what am I trying to say here? Did I even say it? If somebody was reading this, would they even know what the heck I'm doing? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot, yeah. yeah. Having that I believe statement will definitely help. Yeah, that's sure. fantastic. Okay, so I liked this. Okay, this was one that you had wrote uh, that I, we had discussed a little bit before the show. And I thought of my father when I when I wrote a uh, I wrote a blog about uh, when I went into my after when he was in the hospital with COVID. Anyway, the thing you have is honoring loved ones by making it a movie versus a book report. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because you read you read obituaries and what does it feel like, right? For the most yeah. part, it feels like a book report. It feels so, like a book was report. Born at this time, they worked at X Factory for 40 years. They died at this time. And, you know, I've lost people in my life and so have you. And every time you try to reconcile this obituary with that actual person's life, it just doesn't fit. Mm -mm. And so, honestly, I would rather someone exaggerate their family members' stories and exploits then tone them down and, and try to make it sound like a list of things that happened in their life. Because when people leave us, we, we have these memories that aren't just facts, right? Like I lost my grandmother in 2017, but the other day I walked into my house and my wife was upstairs and I just walked in and I said, yoo-hoo, because that's always what my grandmother <laughs> said when, when we walked in her house and we'd go upstairs and she'd have the Aww. peppermint patties like at the top of the fridge. And she didn't realize that like once we were 14, we could reach those and we would eat like six of them at a time. Uh, but that's the stuff that stays with you. And so that doesn't have anything to do with Roberta Brown passed away of this disease yeah. on this date. I, I think the best way to honor your family these days is is to go back and tell the story of one memory you have with someone mm -hmm. who's who's left you. Doesn't doesn't have to be a big thing. People are always looking for big stories. It could be what I just described. Like, yeah, you walk in the house, it smells like this. She says hello this way. She always had your favorite snack, whatever it is. And to write those scenes as if you're living them. And even if you're not trying to make a point, right? Just give color and purpose and honor and life to the relationship instead of just the person. Being it's there. like good character, I, I'll say development, but it's good yes. character development. It, but when you said that, when you described you who it made me chuckle and I felt it. Yes. It made me chuckle and I felt it. Like yes. I, I I could almost feel her energy, like just in that yes. little brief description that you gave of her. Yep. Uh and so yeah, what if yeah, that's that's good stuff right there. Yeah. And obviously I don't get to do the, you, I don't get to do the falsetto when I'm writing, but I would double down. So this is, we'll end on a very practical, tactical kind of thing. I yeah. would double down on the adjectives, right? So I would talk about the fuzzy green carpet and the plaid cushions on the couch. 
I would talk about the lamps on the side that I always almost knocked off when I walked by. I would talk mm. about how the rolls smelled on Easter morning when mm. everyone was sitting down to enjoy brunch together. And I, and I would go very, very, very detailed because, you know, we don't have time to get into all of this because it activates the brain as if the reader was in the room with me. If I describe that to you, you say you feel it. That's really what happens when you read a story that's well-written. You can sit right there at the table with me. And, and that's the the power of writing as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, what I was thinking about when you were sharing that was one, uh, would you would you say, would you agree that a good writer is a very uh, observing individual, like really yes. reverence for what's going on in the environment around them, like true yep. attention to detail? I think of Sherlock Holmes uh, yes. with Jude Law when he's talking about what it's like for him when he comes in and, you know, and he's surveying a room, like he just automatically takes it all in. But when you really pay attention, I, I think that's what's really, it's actually, Oh, I know we got to wrap up this show, but it's Let's really a, a fantastic exercise in uh, um, power of now being completely mm. present in the moment and really taking in what's going on around you. And, and that is, and then being able to express that uh, in such a beautiful way. So I am down because, you know, like I said, this hour would fly and it did fly by. It went by so quickly. Todd, I want to thank you for being here. Anyone, if you've hung on on this show and Todd has a, he has actually a giveaway. Uh, yes. If you go to his website and what what are they going to get, Todd? Yeah, toddbryson.com. I have a tool and an exercise to help you know you're crazy. As it were, it's a daily habit. So just sign up, forward me that welcome email and I'll get it to you. And I'm going to give a hint. Is it something to do with micro journaling? It is. Yeah. It's yeah. It I'm, I'm going to check you. it out. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for being here today. Uh, I could talk to you for another couple hours. Uh, maybe we'll have you back on when your schedule allows. I uh, would love to do that. And for everyone else joining us today, thank you for tuning in. Uh, you can reach Todd at his website. You can also reach out to me at susandene.com. S-U-S-A-N-D-E-N-E-E. -E. Thank you for being here today, folks. And thank you, Todd, again. It was fantastic. Thanks a lot. You have been listening to Know You're Crazy. 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 And my name is Susan Denae. We are identifying, understanding, and treating your crazy one episode at a time. Tune in to TransformationTalkRadio.com. To connect with me or Growth Spurt Your Life, please visit SusanDenae.com. That's Susan Denae, D-E-N-E-E dot -E -E com.